All right, we're finishing Genesis chapter number 48 this morning, and then we'll be uh, starting chapter number 49. We dealt with the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. Instead of Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, as God once again placed the second born in front of the first. He did that with Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel. So God had to appoint another seed, and then we found that with Jacob and Esau. We find it all through the Bible. Sometimes uh, these eldest sons, and, and that's who the birthright belonged to. They lived in the days of the patriarch. Who was the patriarch? He was the spiritual head or spirit, spiritual leader of the family. And these disqualified themselves. They may have been able to financially take care of the family, but not spiritually. And I believe spiritual uh, leadership in a family is more important than financial. So we find at the end of it, uh, uh, just at verse number uh, 20 in chapter 48, he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim, and as Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Verse 21, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Now, Israel is going to stay in Egypt as a nation for 430 years. Uh, Joseph is, I think, about this time he was 56 years of age when this blessing was pronounced. He lived to be 110 years old, so he had lived out one day past half of his life. All right, it, He's not going to live there that long, but they're going to bring his bones out. We'll find out in chapter number 50 when he died. They embalmed him, put him in a coffin, and he told them, when you come out, you bring my bones with you, and Israel did that in the book of Exodus. So we find the prophecy that he was going to bring him in to the land of their fathers, and in verse 22, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. <clears throat> Talking about Joseph. He gave each one of them a portion, but in Joseph, he gave a portion to Ephraim and Manasseh. So he gave a double portion. Oh, what a blessing God bestowed on Joseph at the end of his life. You know, you look back at his life, his life was hard, sold into slavery at 17 years of age. He was 30 years old when finally he stood in front of Pharaoh. So for 13 years, he suffered slavery, bondage, false accusations. He was in prison. He, everything in the world went wrong in his life. And yet we find a young man that served God all through it. I, if I'd been sold in slavery at 17 years of age, uh, I don't know how well I would have been when I was 30 years of age. Uh, but, hey, everybody, Potiphar saw God in him. The jailer saw God in him. Pharaoh saw God in him. Everybody saw God in him. So that tells me a young man that was sold out to God at a young age lived for the Lord. And as far as we find, he lived for the Lord all of his life. So he's coming to the end of his life, and he said, I'm going to give thee a portion above thy brethren. So he gave to Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, we dealt with them last week. Why did he set Ephraim before Manasseh? One, uh, Ephraim was greater in number. If you go to the book of uh, Exodus, you find that I think there was 8,300 more men in the tribe of Ephraim than there was Manasseh. And then when you go over to the book of Numbers, when they moved out, they set the standard of Ephraim before Manasseh. But then we find that Manasseh, all of Manasseh did not go into Canaan. You have those that stayed on the east side. You remember they built the altar ed as a witness that in the years to come when people saw that division of the Jordan River that they would know that they were still on Israel's side. But half of the tribe of Manasseh stayed on the eastern side of, of the Jordan River. So you had three tribes. You had Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that would not go across. Hey, God brought them out of Egypt to take them into Canaan. He never intended for anybody to, to live over on the other side. Moses gave permission. Now, I'm not saying God had his stamp of approval on it, but Moses told them, if you'll go over armed for war, when the war is over with in Canaan, then you can come back, you can dwell on the other side. 
So we find that Ephraim was more honorable than Manasseh. Now, what I want to do is get into chapter number 49. We'll get into some prophecy here. Uh, Jacob or Israel is getting ready to die, and what he's doing, he's telling what's going to happen to his kids in the last days. How'd you like to know what's going to happen to your kids in the last days? I think I'd be scared to know what was going to happen to my kids in the last days. Hey, we, we, live, in, we live in bad days. I'm just going to tell you everything. There's a song that says change and decay and all around I see. You see thing, we see a decaying uh, all the way around. The, the old paths of scripture, the old paths of the churches are being forsaken. People today like the modern churches. They like the modern way of doing things. And, and I understand that sometimes things change. But we see a general trend spiritually that's downhill in young people. I, there's not that many anymore that are uh, surrendering it to the gospel to preach the word of God. You just don't find that much anymore. You used to, you had a lot of young men in the ministry now you've got more men quitting the ministry, retiring or dying, than you've got filling their boots. Uh, Brother Earl Green, I was talking to him the other day. He went up to a interim pastor school. They've got a, uh, had a place GFA had uh, it up at Greenville, to where they were trying to introduce these pastors without churches to churches that couldn't get pastors. <clears throat> you've got them all over the place. So we see a general trend now. Verse number one of chapter 49, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last day. Again, I'm glad I don't know my future. I know one thing about my future. I plan on serving God. By the grace of God, as long as I've got a breath in my body, I've got, I want to serve the Lord. I want to pastor as long as I can pastor. But at the same time, Hey, I know I'm going to heaven. I know one day I'm going to die. If Jesus doesn't come back, I know all that. But at the same time, I don't know what's going to befall me in the last days, and I don't know that I'd want to know that. Uh, uh, if I knew everything that would have befallen me over the last 40 years, 50 years, I, I don't know. I think I might have run in the other direction sometimes. But he's going to tell them what's going to happen to them. Verse number two, gather yourselves together and hear you sons of Jacob. He said, I want you to hear what I'm going to say, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Notice the two names given to Jacob are found in this one verse. Who's Jacob? He said, you listen to the old supplanter. Jacob knew what it was to fail God. Now, he was a supplanter. That's what Jacob means. <clears throat> been in trouble most of his life in and out. Matter of fact, he said, my days have been few in number and they've been evil. He said, I've not attained to the years of my fathers over in the last chapter. So he said, one, I want you to listen to what I can tell you wisdom that happened to me, all right? He's, he's gonna look back and give them some wisdom looking back. I tell young people, you listen to old people. They have failed just like you failed. They know what it is to fail God. They know what it is to fail. You know, most of the things I've learned in life, I've learned the hard way. I was not that I was real hard headed. I, you know, I, everybody. But you know, when I set my mind to do something, I was going to try to do it my way. They asked Thomas Edison one time, "What did he learn when he made the light bulb?" I think he said this. He said, "I've learned three thousand things that won't make a light bulb." That's what life's all about. Life is sometimes trial and error. Sometimes we're not sure which way to go and we take a path or we do something. I've learned how to fix a lot of things in my life. I'm kind of a handyman around the house. If it needs to be fixed, I can patch it up. I can fix it. I can get it running. I can get it. Hey, I learned that because we didn't have enough money to pay somebody to do it. So I had to take them apart. I've got a small motor I need to take apart and work on that. And here shortly, I'm gonna put it on my workbench, take it apart, I'm gonna check everything. I'm gonna sand down uh, what needs to be sanded and set the points back in it, and get everything ready, to try to get it running again. I learned that by taking them apart and then not knowing how to put them back together. So I've learned something when I take something apart, 
I'll take the first part, if I don't know what I'm doing, and lay it there in the second part here, and then I'll just reverse that when I put it back together, try to get it together. So Israel is going to be talking to them out of the wisdom of man, or Jacob. But Israel means prince. So he's going to be talking to them individually, but he's also going to be talking to them nationally. What's going to happen in the last day? What's going to happen to America? I know this, if America doesn't get right with God, America has no hope. And I don't see any movement across this land today to get right with God. I see a move across this land to try to get somebody elected or whatever in November the 3rd, and that's not a bad thing. But at the same time, if, if we elect somebody and America continues spiritually in the uh, way it's going, America's going to collapse. God said he would turn into hell all nations that forget God. Matter of fact, he even uh, prophesied Christ did. He talked about woe unto thee Chorazan and woe unto thee Bethsaida and all these places. He said if the works had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah that was done in you, he said they'd have repented a long time ago. So he's going to be looking back as Jacob, but he's going to be looking forward as Israel. So he's going to tell them from a human perspective what they need to do and then from a spiritual perspective. Now I want to start in verse number three this morning. He deals with the firstborn of Leah. That was the wife that God gave him. You need to understand he loved Rachel. She was beautiful, look upon, well-favored young lady, had everything going for her. Leah was tender-eyed, but God gave him Leah. God never gave him a second wife. God was not into multiple wives and them having four wives and concubines and all this. Solomon, I've often said, uh, he was the wisest foolish man who ever lived. Man had a thousand wives, 300 wives and 700 concubines, which is a servant's but wife, but it's a consummated wife. He had a thousand wives. You know, the Bible said, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing to obtain the favor of the Lord. And somebody said, What favor did you get and you got married? I got a good mother in law. I thank God every day. I loved my mom in law. My mom in law loved me. But hey, Solomon got a thousand mother in laws. Now, I don't know how that worked out for him back in those days. But at the same time, Leah was the one that God gave him, and he should have stopped with Leah. But he didn't do that. He had to have a Ra Rachel, and then they had Bilhah, and then Zilpah. He uh, ended up with four wives and ended up with a mess. But he's going to discuss one Reuben. Who's Reuben? Reuben, the word Reuben means see a son. Just telling Jacob at that time, Leah said, hey, you see, I brought you a son. That's why he named him Reuben. It means see a son. I've got a son. I want you to see and understand. Boys were very prized. Not that they didn't think a lot of little girls, but they took care of their little girls. You had better not say anything wrong or lay a hand on a virgin in Israel. When you did, you had everybody down on the top of your head. They, they elevated these ladies in the right way, but at the same time, they wanted sons in order to run the house, to take the, uh, the uh, hold of the house and the leadership. So the firstborn son of Leah was Reuben, and then he was the patriarch in waiting. The oldest son, again, what's he going to do? He's going to run the family, physically and spiritually. That's what his obligation was, but he got set aside. Now, we're going to look at him just for a few minutes this morning, then we'll move on down to the next one. But same time, he should have been the patriarch in waiting. Matter of fact, notice what he said about him. Thou art my firstborn, my might, my strength. That firstborn should have been the strength of the family, not just a physical strength. There's more than that. Somebody asked a man the other day, uh, and the man was a Navy, retired Navy SEAL, and they said, boy, uh, did, did they have uh, enough physically tough men to meet the requirements? He said they had more than enough. But he said what makes a good Navy SEAL is not your physical toughness, it's your mental toughness. And he made a statement. He said, you may kill me, 
but you will never stop me. That's a mentality that goes along with it. When he's talking about the might, he's talking about someone who would take the reins of that family, the strength of that family, and, and make sure that things were done right, that they were done timely, not only spiritually, but physically, financially, and otherwise. So he said, you are the firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. The reason he said beginning, Jacob knew that he was going to have other children. This was not going to be the only son. He knew that he'd have other children. Matter of fact, he had more children by Leah. But at the same time, he said, you're the beginning of my strength. This is the firstborn. A lot of times, a firstborn child will be named after the father. Uh, they, some families do that. Uh, I'm Robert David Johnston Sr. There's Robert David Johnston Jr. There's Robert David Johnston III. So there's three of us uh, that have the same name. I got tickled one time. I was dealing with the IRS. Don't you love to deal with the IRS? They called me and said, you owe us $5,000. Now you got to prove you don't owe them. I didn't owe my dime. They owed me money. And when we got off the phone, then they paid me the money that I need to be paid. But they said, well, we've got you mixed up with somebody else. It's Robert David Johnston. I said, do we have the same Social Security number? I said, lady, do you know there's over 30 Robert David Johnstons at that time that you could find online in the United States of America? I said, have you got me tied to all of that crowd? I told him, I said, her Social Security different. I thought myself, she's not smart enough to work for the IRS. You work off Social Security numbers, okay? Now, notice what it said, beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity. That's an interesting statement. Reuben may have been his might and the beginning of his strength, but he was not the excellency of his dignity. Dignity is when you do right. People have dignity. We live in a day where they tell you you're supposed to respect everybody. I give everybody respect until they take it away. But listen, if you're not going to live a life that's respectful, don't tell me I've got to respect you. I'm not going to respect you if you're not living a respectful life. Now, you're going to, and by the way, I'll give it to you initially, but then if you don't live respectfully, I'm going to make you earn it back the second time. You're not going to just get it and hand it to you, all right? He said he was a excellency of dignity. That's what he was supposed to be. Not only his might and his strength, but he was supposed to be a proper child to live in the right manner. I thank God for men that, listen, they just live for God. They've got character. Along with that character then, you've got integrity. I saw on a sign one time, you either have character or you are one. That's a pretty good statement going to sign. You either have it. We live in days where a lot of people don't have character anymore. They don't take care of their business. They just, boy, hey, they don't, don't even want to get into that. And I'm talking about older folks. That generation, even that I was raised in, these baby boomers, a lot of them have lost it. I mean, they have flat lost it. They don't live the way they ought to live. They, uh, they just lost it. But anyway, he said, the excellency of my dignity, and then because of the dignity, the excellency of power. Now, he mentioned that he's the beginning of my might and strength. What is power? Power is not might and strength. Power is different. I've never been a big weight lifter, but I learned years ago, I lifted a lot of weights for a while. Uh, there's an old saying, with repetition you get definition. You can take, you don't have to lift 500 pounds, you can take uh, 50 to, uh, you can go down to Walmart, get a 110 pound set of weights. And you can do reps with that, and if you do reps with that, then you build definition. But in order to build power, you have got to add weight. We used to start out with 10 reps, and then go down to eight reps, and then go down to five, and go down to three, and then go down to one until you maxed out. And when you maxed out, we always wanted to lift a little more than you could lift. That's why you had a spotter. Didn't want him lifted. If he could just get you started past what we call that pinch point, 
If he could get you past that, you could push it on up, you set it down, and then you worked yourself back down again, and that's the way we used to do it. But in order to have power, you've got to add weight. So we use that statement here, the excellency of power. In other words, the more weight you put on him, the stronger he got instead of the weaker he got. A lot of people shy away from responsibility. Uh, they don't shoulder it. I've often said the measure of a man is not how big you are, it's not how strong you are, it's how you do what's right. You shoulder your responsibility and you do what's right, even if it costs you what you want. Hey, we don't put our wants above our family. We put what's right above our family. That's what makes you a good leader uh, in a home. You've got to do what's right. So he used several things with him. One, his might, beginning of my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Now, if he'd stopped there, it'd have been real nice, wouldn't it? Look at verse 4. Unstable as water. You know, water always takes the path of least resistance. You watch it. Water will always take the path of least resistance. If it's running down a hill, it's not going to go over the top of a rock. It'll go around a rock. It'll make its own little ruts after a while, and it'll follow the ruts. It goes the path. Water's kind of like deer. You know what makes deer easy to hunt? They always take the path of least resistance. They'll always cross a creek and they'll have roads at certain places because it's an easy crossing there. They can get in and out of it so you can set up on them on those places. Now, he talked about him. Why was he not the patriarch? One, he was unstable as water. Water has to be contained in order to have stability to it. Somebody said, you, I like what Lowell Kirkendall told me years ago, he said only two things you have to know to be a plumber. He said, one, that sewage won't run uphill, and two, Friday's payday. <laughs> I've heard him say that many times. I've got a lot of good wisdom out of Brother Lowell over the years. He said, Friday's payday, and you make a pretty good plumber. All right? He said, you've got the stability of water. If something does not contain you, you'll take the path of least resistance every time. Path of least resistance is not always bad, but there are some times when you've got to take the hard way. Sometimes being a man, you've got to make the hard decisions, not the easy decisions. You've got to make hard decisions. You've got to be able to do that. We used to say step up to the plate. My dad used to use the term. He'd say, you need to suck it up. And just simply, Barbara always said, what's that mean? It means just suck that gut in and throw your shoulders back and you do what you need to be doing, all right? He was unstable as water. He could not be depended on to make a right decision at the right time. He could only be depended on to make a failure when he needed to go forward, all right? So he was unstable with water. Second thing, he said, and thou shalt not excel. If you're unstable, in other words, can't be dependent on, what's stability? In our day, a lot of it's faithfulness. We live in days where people are sometimes not faithful anymore. They just, I don't, I, they just have a problem with faithfulness. You know what? You know, if we have church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If you can be there, you ought to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But you look at the crowds as they go down at certain times. I understand you get older, you don't want to drive at night and things. Hey, I've got all of that. Sometimes you can't get off work during the week. I've got all of that. Sometimes you got your ox in the ditch. I've got all of that. But a lot of people just sit at the house because they're too lazy to get up and go to church. And unfaithfulness. They cannot be depended on. They're unstable. And he said, thou shalt not excel. One, if you're not a hard worker on your job, you're not going to excel on the job. I think you ought to be a hard worker. We're back here working the other day. when I'm used to working by myself. So what I've learned to do is not take many steps to get something done. I don't go to the outbuilding 15 times if I can make one trip or two trips and get everything done at the same time. Uh, if I clean a house, and by the way, I know how to clean a house. I stay in one room and clean that room till it's clean. 
If you're not careful, you're going to go from this end of the house to that end, to this end, to that end, to this end. You don't get anything done that way. What you've got to do, you've got to learn to work smart. Save yourself the steps, get the job done, and get the job done very quickly. So we find he said you're not going to excel. You won't excel in your physical life. You won't excel in your business life. And you certainly won't excel in your spiritual life. So Reuben had some big problems. So one, he said you're unstable and you'll not excel. Now, notice what he based that on. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledest thou it, he went up to my couch. This young man did not have control of his passions. He went up and actually had a physical relationship with Jacob's wife in his own bed. Now you're talking about a travesty that took place. Years ago, I knew a father-in-law that stole his daughter-in-law, and I thought, what, a, what an absolute travesty that you find when, when somebody would do that. Though that. That's an impurity of heart. That's an impurity of thought. So Reuben had a problem. One, he gave in to the desires of his flesh in a wrong manner. So we all understand we're adults. It said, Eve, you went up to thy father's bed, then defiled thou it. He went up to my couch. So he could not be depended on. on. You say, well, did his father forgive him? He's talking to him. But I'm going to tell you what, there's some things you don't excuse. Uh, we get, get a lot of that with politicians. You catch them, and when you catch them and they're doing wrong, the first, the first thing that they do, they always get right with God. You ever notice that? Oh, I, I, I repented. I got saved. I did this. I did that. I, uh, and most of the time, it's cover-up. And that's all it is. Then they'll turn around. They'll do the same thing again. Now, I've learned a long time ago, if somebody does something wrong, learn to forgive them. Everybody on that page, learn to forgive. The Bible said, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a big step. You learn to forgive, but you do not excuse. What they want you to do is excuse what they did. I believe when somebody runs for public office, they mess up, they need to get out. And yet we've got Washington, D.C. that are full of them that continually mess up and stay in. And people vote them in. They say, oh, you mean you can't forgive them? Absolutely forgive them, but I'm not going to excuse them. We've got a lot of pastors that way. We've got a lot of, you know, one, that, one of the aspects of a pastor is, he, is to be blameless. Now, blameless is not sinless. There's not a one of us, hey, you could follow me around, find me, and me say something, do something that you uh, might not think I ought to have said and, and did. That's not what he's talking about. Sometimes uh, the, our flesh gets uh, in the way and we say something or do something that we shouldn't have done. But blameless is when you violate something that will disqualify uh, uh, you from this pulpit. Now, you need to come and get it right with the church, get it right with God. But at that point in time, you've got a disqualification on your hands. We've got a lot of people. I knew one one time. He openly messed up with another woman. He got in the pulpit, and he uh, stood up there and confessed it to the church. And you know what? First thing he did, all these other pastors started having him come fill their pulpits. I wouldn't let him fill my pulpit. I wouldn't let him do that. All right? Why? Because it's, this is something that's well known. It was known, and what happened was he, there was a disqualification as a pastor, as a bishop, for him to get back in that pulpit again. So he said, you defiled my bed, you defiled my couch, you're unstable as water. As old Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, Reuben sold it for a moment of physical pleasure. He sold himself out at that time. Unstable as water, the easiest route, a breach of trust. Over in First Chronicle chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So he set himself aside. 
The tribe of Reuben refused to cross over Jordan. Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh. The entire tribe of Reuben stayed on the east of Jordan. The whole tribe. They went over to fight. But when they came back, they gave up God's land. They didn't want God's land. They didn't want Canaan's land. And by the way, there's plenty of room for them over there. They did not want that land, and they gave it up. Now, verses 5 down through 7, we're going to start with Simeon and Levi. We're not going to get very far with them. But it said, Simeon and Levi are brethren. He puts the next two. Who's Simeon? He's the second born. Levi is the third born. So he set Reuben aside, but now he's going to call these other two brothers. He's tying them together. They're brothers with all of them. Are they not? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, they're all, hey, they're all brothers. But he ties these two together in a single act. Something that they did, he said, Simeon and Levi are brethren. So he's going to tie them together. I'm just going to stop at that this morning because I don't want to get into that yet. But we're going to stop right here. But he sent Reuben aside. Now he's going to set Simeon and Levi aside. So the birthright's not going to go to Reuben, and it's not going to go to Simeon, and it's not going to go to Levi. They didn't do what Reuben did, but what they did, they did together. So he's going to deal with both of them at the same time. We look back, we got Jacob talking to them on the fleshly side. Fleshly wisdom. Young people, you want to be smart, you go to old men, ask them how to do something, they'll help you. Now, if you go out there and try to do it all on yourself, eventually you're going to get it done. But I remember years ago I was working outside and Brother Terrell Shipman was over at the house sitting in a chair watching me work. <laughs> Giving me advice right and left. A matter of fact, he did that. We put this roof on this building. He sat down there in a chair telling us how to do it. And when they cut the tabs off the shingles, they were throwing them, you know, like you, they sail. They were sailing them at old brother Terrell. He was down there ducking those things. But you know what? He gave me some good advice sitting in that chair. He ran my help off. I had one of my sons, and finally he said, Dad, if he's that good, let him do it. He left me by myself. But same time, Israel looking back. No, Israel looked forward. He's talking nationally. He's talking about their placement. But he's looking back from a physical sense at what these young men turned into. And instead of getting that thing straight and getting their life straight, they continued in that way. Reuben was unstable as water. And he said, you will never excel. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. I pray you bless the word of God this morning. Bless the morning service. I pray for the memorial service this afternoon that God would just meet the need of some hearts there and pray for Miss Linda Lord you'd bless her today I know it's going to be another hard day on her and then Lord bless her in the days to come in Jesus name we pray amen all right going to the prayer rooms